Well, hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 445th New Social Environment. I'm Nick Bennett, the Special Projects Editor here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between Paulina Olovska and Jason Rosenfeld. We're thrilled to have the poet Gia Gonzalez here, who will read to close today's program. A few notes before we get started. The Rail acknowledges that Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you to check the chat for a living document of resources and actions that we'll be posting in just a moment. Over the past 21 years here at the Brooklyn Rail, uh, we've undertaken a miraculous journey, bringing together in a single monthly publication, art, music, dance, film, theater, literature, alongside thoughtful social and political meditations. As a small nonprofit, we need your help. This December, we are fundraising $150,000 in 31 days, and your contributions will directly support our writers, guest artists, production staff, and operations at the rail for the coming year. Please check the chat for more information and links that we'll be sharing in just a moment. But now to introduce today's guest and host, Paulina Olowska lives and works in Poland and has had one person exhibitions at Kunsthal Basel, the Stedelijk Museum Amsterdam and the Zacheda National Gallery of Art in Warsaw. She received the prestigious Aachen Art Prize in 2014 with an associated exhibition at the Ludwig Forum for International Art also in Aachen. She has also staged performances at the Tate Modern, the Carnegie International and the Museum of Modern Art here in New York. Her exhibition House Proud at Metro Pictures is on view through December 11th. And our host today, Jason Rosenfeld, PhD, is Distinguished Chair and Professor of Art History at Marymount Manhattan College and curated the exhibitions John Everett Millay at the Tate Britain and Van Gogh Museum, Pre-Raphaelites, Victorian Avant-Garde at the Tate Britain and the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC, and River Crossings at Olana and Cedar Grove at, uh, in Hudson and Catskill, New York. He is a senior writer and editor at large here at the Brooklyn Rail, Without further ado, over to you, Jason. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, welcome, everybody. It's great to see you all again. It's been a couple months for me. Um, happy 10th night of Hanukkah. We just keep going, um, keep counting. And uh, uh, thank you so much to uh, Nick and Fong and the whole team at The Rail uh, for supporting these programs. We are, as Nick mentioned, number 445th new social environment which is incredible since March of 2020 and still going strong. All of these, of course, are recorded and put on to YouTube for posterity. Uh, we're developing an amazing catalog of conversations with artists and writers and poets and, uh, and keeping track of critical culture around the world. Also, thank you to Jake uh, and Alexander at Metro Pictures who've been terrific in helping us to put this together. Uh, and in advance, Gia, our poet for today. I'm looking forward to hearing your poetry. So uh, welcome, Paulina. How are you? Thank you, you thank you for having me. <laughs> Good. Paulina is coming to you live from Norway, uh, which is not her normal haunt, but a little bit outside of Oslo. She's on site visit. Um, I'm coming to you live from the West Village. And we want to thank everybody who's tuning in, including our fans in Greenpoint, um, big Polish community there. And uh, any, if you're a fan of Robert Lewandowski, you're a fan of Paulina, um, two of the great Poles uh, in culture yeah, today. Yeah, friends. good luck. Good, is it? Good luck against Russia on March 24th in World Cup qualifying. Um, so today uh, we are we are pleased to have you here. We can talk about your magnificent show, which is on view right now at Metro Pictures. I'm going to start the share. Um, hang on a second. At Metro Pictures through Saturday. So get down there to see it on 24th Street. Here is the uh, website with this incredible suite of three paintings, sort of like a triptych um, of works in the back room, which we will talk about. The exhibition is called House Proud. House Proud uh, opened in early November and it's a knockout. There were tons of people there last Saturday when I went there to check it out again. Um, and maybe just say a few words about Metro Pictures um, because they have been a, an essential element of the New York art world for years and years. Um, I wanna put in the chat uh, a link to a page on their website that sort of surveys their 40 years 
of activity in um, the city. And I'm showing you some photos of the founders, uh, Janelle and Helene. And maybe uh, Pauline, if you don't mind, talk a little bit about what the gallery has meant to you and you know the, their impact and, and the effect of their precedent in two women setting up a gallery in 1980 uh, has had really on the themes of this show. Yes, so um, uh, I have been working with Metro Pictures for over 10 years, and this is my fourth show. And sadly, uh, it's the last show in Metro Pictures. Um, and Metro opened 40 years ago by Helene Reiling and uh, uh, Janelle Reiling and Helene Wiener. And um, they, you know, they set up the pictures generation. Um, what uh, what it means is that, you know, they started working with Louise Lawler, they started working with Robert Longo and Cindy Sherman. So when I had joined in uh, as a painter, um, uh, my first show was uh, around two uh, 2006. Um, it was an incredible, you know, input, how will my work will stand against this historical, um, you know, uh, reference and relevance and so on. Although I did have a connection to the use of images in my work as well, which um, in my earlier works, it was connected very much to modernism. But as you see with the show, I started to be interested in symbolism and the representation of the figure. So being there was a natural, and I, you know, I'm very much of a push towards my work. How do I create shows in Metro Pictures? And it was incredible to be showing aside Louise Lawler, like on the picture of uh, Helene and Jenner that you're showing, it's Mike uh, Kelly that I met and I had, you know, personal conversation about how you, you know, how do you create shows, what appropriation means. And, um, so um, making the last show, which it wasn't planned, yes. Yeah? So in about uh, March last year, Metro had announced the closing, and um, artists, you know, people inside uh, inside of the gallery, we had to respect this decision. And it is it's a you know it's a gallery's decision, but it's a decision of our times. And this is what Metro is always that it's iconic with choices and with exhibitions. So um, while making the last show, um, I didn't have much time. I had uh, six and a half months to work um, on the works. But gladly in this moment of time, I didn't do a lot of traveling and I thought I'm gonna push it and I'm gonna do it the best I can. And I'm gonna have the reference to the history in a more or less delicate and sensitive way in between how you can quote, how you can discuss a finale. But because of my work, I deal with retrospectives like I deal with ontology, I deal into looking inside nostalgia, it also kind of felt really the right to the show. So I decided to have a ongoing topic and this is where the title of the show is coming, How Sprout, which is covering um, images of in between fantasy and real ideas of women gatherings and women um, women creating an educational and environment for exploration of um, being together and womanhood. So we've got an idea of community um, in all of these works that runs through this, all of these works. Little, you know, this was new to my previous show because I usually work with a figure, like an, um, a one figure and the mm -hmm. paintings have this sense of one to one size because they're slightly sometimes the figures are slightly bigger but it's also the representation of you know the contact of the painting towards you how do you reflect on the figure mm -hmm. so here um here it's from a show of uh, 2011 um yeah it's an interesting work that jason you had pulled out so um it's a show um that is called the revenge of the wise woman. And of course the wise woman has something, it was, it, and it, you were completely right to find this as a kind of changing moment of my relationship. But even in this painting, you see that there is a relationship with a work of art, which in this, uh, on the right images, of course, in the background of Yves Saint Laurent, um, uh, fashion advertising, which is actually taken by Norman Parkinson. We have the painting of, um, 
Francis Bacon. And, you know, as a painter, I want to ask, what does it mean to be painting? What does it mean for me to be painting a painting of Francis Bacon? And of course, this is the level, you know, my figure, the woman, she becomes the painting itself, the fashion becomes the painting. And actually in that painting, I really enjoy just painting this luscious dress so much, but also the, you know, the cupping of the hand of uh, Francis, this was the whole idea of attention, like, and using the, um, the homage to another photographer, which was Norman Parkinson, which I quote in my work, which is also in this show, that uh, with the show How Sprout, I worked with the archive uh, of Deborah Tuberville. So people are gonna see the works from the present show, but I thought I would show this to start because it kind of marked as Paulina saying a sort of shift in her work. Um, it would take us hours and hours to go through Pauline's career, which is extraordinary. Um, she uh, got her BFA in Chicago, actually, having grown up in Poland at the Art Institute, and then her MFA in Gdansk um, in Poland. So she has worked in uh, multiple continents and has worked in performance and uh, choreography and staging. You can read about all this stuff in a great catalog called Book, called Book, which you can get from J. Uh, J RP Press, really excellent. Um, and then, uh, you know, she's still doing these things, um, all different kinds of uh, media, but in the terms of the paintings, which this show is comprised of, except for one short video, um, they sort of follow along the lines that are kind of established here. So you have an interest in fashion photography, an interest in fine art from multiple periods, not necessarily contemporary art, although you here you see a, a late Francis Bacon sort of, uh, channeled in the back of this image uh, and an interest in texture, which you'll see uh, in the painting. So um, there are a lot of complications going on in the present work uh, and also the addition of multiple figures instead of just the single figure sort of fashion plate like you see here, but this is a really striking work. And of course, as someone who many of you know, is a student of 19th century art, did my degree in Victorian painting. Uh, I immediately thought of the works of uh, Joseph uh, Mayhofer, um, especially this painting, which is one of the great masterpieces of the turn of the century in Europe, Strange Garden from 1902, 1903, which is in Warsaw in the National Museum. I saw it in a show at Tate Britain in London, Symbolist Art in Poland, which was in 2009, which my sometime collaborator, Alison Smith, curated. And it was all the rage in England uh, that year. They loved it. Why? because it looks like pre-Raphaelite art, it resembled Victorian art, but it is weird. It is strange and freaky and bizarre and um, refulgent and, and gorgeous uh, and in a way that you know, is really appealing. So these kinds of pictures, which are not well known in the US because American museums, frankly, don't collect them. Um, they were known to some people like myself who were students of Robert Rosenblum at the Institute fine arts in New York University, because he was interested in everything which was off the modernist beaten track. Um, so these kinds of pictures sort of have a real resonance. And I pulled up uh, just here a detail um, of this work with this incredible dragonfly that is just a bizarrity. And it relates to uh, Mayhoff's work as, Mayhoff's work as a stained glass artist. You can see that there. And then I pulled out this painting uh, which uh, is one of Paulina's uh, works for 2016, the Lepidopterist. Lepidopterist, fam most famous was, of course, Nabokov. But here are the Lepidopterists from 2016. So, you know, what, what was your awareness of the traditions of Polish art growing up in Krakow um, and in your education? Were, they, were you people even looking at this stuff in Gdansk in the 19, in, you know, 1990s when you were at school there? Well, uh, uh, of course, that was, you know, what, the only art that we could see was the classical art. And this is actually, you know, the story that me as a BFA in Art Institute of Chicago, which was really ongoing and amazing schools. And my teachers were from um, uh, Paula Rego to Charles Ray to uh, Carrie Marshall. So I had incredible mm -hmm. um, you know, feedback on what I knew always that I want to be painting because, 
you know, around the year of, uh, you know, mid 90s and 2000, there was not a discussion on painting, yes, like, um, and, you know, there was a couple of few contemporary painters that I had an appeal to, so it was Elizabeth Payton, I couldn't relate to Luke Timons, who later on became my teacher, and to, you know, somebody like Karen Klimnik. So I was trying to, you know, like with this, like sweaters and holes to picture, like, how do I want to be a figurative painter? And this is why I had returned um, for MFA to Gdansk Small Academy uh, with a very classical upbringing because I thought I just want to concentrate on the methods of painting, which I find really even more fascinating than the figuration in the painting. Like, how do you apply a form? What is the economy of painting? How do you deal with this? And you got, got it also really right that one of my big uh, hero figures was uh, v um, Vyotorkiewicz, who was a more a symbolist painter, and Mehofer. And um, because I like to share my kind of interest, um, in 2009, if I'm not wrong, I was invited by Camden Art Center and um, in London to make a curated show. And the show was based on a Mehofer painting, which was a portrait of his wife sideways. But on top of her head was this, was it an animal? Was it a head? Was it a monster? So the surrealness of, uh, you know, Mehofer and our viewers could see like, it, you know, it's pretty Photoshop. Like how did he put this dragon fly in, right? But also how he deals with lights. There's so much more to tell and the refinement. And also what I loved in his work is how draping can give you another sense of understanding. So, you know, my concept of Mehofer was that the portrait is there, but what's happening around, like in the Lepidopterus, you know, like, I wish we would share these paintings, but you can see the House Proud paintings in, in mm -hmm. wheel, because the ground is painted like on, you know, like the, it's, she's coming from the inside of the earth. So, yeah. so this is what I really like about figurative painting that actually it has so much to say about the paint itself that it becomes, you know, um, and especially that's why I love fashion because fashion can be so painterly luscious as well that you can touch on, you know, different different methods of uh, how do you use paint? What is a painting? Right, absolutely. And, you know, people should not think that you're working in a kind of poster style. Um, when you see the works from a distance, they may have that feel, but as we'll see when we look at some details, they're uh, extraordinarily constructed. They really are about, like you're saying, uh, the painting speaking in a way in these figurative works. So let's look at the, some of the new works. Um, this one, uh, which is on the left in the first room, the School of Archery after Deborah Turbeville from 2021, uh, one of the showstoppers on 20, West 24th Street uh, right now. These uh, one, two, three, four, five, six uh, female uh, archers um, who are, relaxing uh, in, one might say, not necessarily very sensible outdoor clothing to be lying around in the grass, uh, very luxurious, you know, um, kind of scene in a sense. So uh, what goes into something like this? What were, you, what were you thinking when you're doing these kinds of works? Well, you know, I do have a history with fashion as well. So yeah. you do a lot for fashion itself. And um, I was doing photo shoots uh, three years ago for the, um, I was the uh, editor of the art um, for um, art issue for Vogue Poland, so mm -hmm. I kind of have a sense. And I used to do, you know, shoots in photography, you know. So some of the work has um, I'm pre-using photographs, which I really think could have another place in history, like Deborah's work. Um, but I like the sense, you know, like in Mehofer's work, like the sense of the oddity of a situation, yes. So, um, uh, yes, for example, um, in relation to ship to the photograph, I wanted the forest to be more kind of eerie, yes, and more strange or more, I'm going to even work is the word phallic in a way, yes? Because for me, the relationship of the women and then going to the topic, why I have the archery um, school and the my, uh, feminist mycology is what do women represent? What do women gatherings represent, yes? So I thought with this painting, my, you know, my insight kind of story was that 
like kind of relaxing, but having the weapon, you know, as, as this other story, and then the apple comes in as this, you know, temptation. But when I was making this painting, I was thinking, oh, should they be shooting, you know, and something should maybe I uh, add like mehfer, some weird animals or so on. Mm. But like the apple became the, you know, because then, you know, the other story that I love about painting is color. Yes, how much color can take, um, can tell. And of course, one of my favorites color and in my work, like you show the cover of my book is red, yes, because it has so many implications. So the red apple, the red arrows, the red um, or more orangey color, yeah. the red lipstick, these are the things that can tell even a more um, uh, interwined story in a painting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, when you have these points of color in a work, which is kind of grounded in a particular tone, they really leap out at you. So that's sort of what Poussin did in his pictures. And then it draws your eye around the composition. And I love the way they sort of form kind of a wedge coming out towards you. And then all the trees recede into the background, if you call them phallic. The men go into the background and the women are foregrounded in this picture, speaking of a bunch of men. When you, school, when you call something the school of, it makes me think of uh, works by artists like Raphael, the School of Athens, 1509, where you have, you know, the, the, I'm not claiming influence here because it, it isn't so clear. Although this image of Michelangelo as Heraclitus is not so far removed from the lounging woman in the foreground, it's kind of happy circumstance. Um, but in Raphael's supreme high Renaissance conception of the conglomeration of all knowledge, which is all male, in this testosterone fueled idea of ancient Greece um, in the architecture of ancient Rome, you have a real riposte to that here, a real rejection of that here um, in a different way with these women in their sartorial splendor laid out here in the forest. Let's show people a couple images by Deborah Turberville, um, who uh, was a photographer, long history, um, worked in New England um, and worked for magazines all over the world. She died in 2013, and I with these found these wonderful photos from 1974, which are quite spectral and definitely related to you know 19th century art. Um, definitely related to the kind of um, aimless aestheticism of works like uh, American artist Thomas Wilmer doing. If people know his work, of sort of women all standing around, or Fernand Knopf, the Belgian symbolist. They're very much related to his paintings of. Uh, his sister Marguerite in landscapes, and then also the modernist alienation in films like Antonioni's movies. You get that feeling very strongly uh, in these works. So uh, what attracts you to her work in particular? Well, because um, in, on the beginning, all my work, uh, you know, started with a sense of the magazine. Yes, like the magazine was my way of reforming my um, mm. symbolism and the alphabet of my paintings, yes. And I had started working um, on the beginning of, uh, of when I left the art school and then the Rijks Academy in Amsterdam. I started to work, and maybe because I was outside of Poland, with T, T in Ya magazine, which is a 1960s magazine that is a collage by itself. So it was made by uh, artists. It kind of got, it was a, uh, um, it was a public magazine, it, um, uh, but it got like a sense of fantasy. But uh, just to keep it short, you know, I was just really, uh, really informed by this self-made fashion shows because the fashion really didn't exist in 1960s and 70s in Poland because there was no brands, but it was more the sense of imitation of fashion. So um, I think Deborah has this that we don't know at the end, are this fashion shoots or is it a preparation of a film? What is the sense of the relationship? Then what attracted me in her, um, and especially these depictions, was the relationship with nature, yes? Are they a part of it? Do they become, you know, what is the relationship in between the women? And even the cropping, like with this picture that you're showing, like the little girl on the side, like what is she doing? So uh, what really attracted me to her work, and this is why um, when I was preparing the house proud, I went to New Jersey to visit her archive, was like how 
how do, does she create this um, this tension with you know working for brands as Givenchy or Valentino, but also having loads of photographs where she is using the female female figure as a symbolist of a story and a muse and so on. So when I was visiting the archive, I found out that she was fascinated with Krakow, and she did, um, you know, she did. Um, two or three uh, photo sessions and uh, fashion sessions with the Cantor's brothers, yes. Um, the two, the Cantor, Tadeusz Cantor has the, the famous twin brothers who kind of were a part of his Krikot theater. And then I found out, he, you know, that he, she had this relationship with a small town in Mexico where um, I would be also intrigued by the atmosphere and wanting to shoot you know, photographs. So I guess as a painter, this relationship of what is a photographic, but what can become much more, even through painting, emblematic, always kind of impacted me. Yeah. So, um, I have a good quote for you from her. She, she said once, I'm not a romantic photographer. I want to get on people's nerves, eerie, not definitively eerie like Joel Peter Whitkin. Mine is a more subtle way. And I think that kind of sums it up you know that okay. sort of strangeness that you sense in it yeah. and that like you were talking about that juxtaposition of woman with nature you know if we're looking at your painting on the left and woman since basically since uh, venetian painting in the renaissance was associated with nature and the male with the urban the city um and on in your picture on the left you know they're really kind of removed from the forest even though they're sort of uh, splayed in front of it but in paintings like Edward Manet's Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe, sorry for the typo, on the right, in 1863, um, you know, he is making that connection between the men wearing their perfectly designed bourgeois outfits and the women who are either in classical drapery or nude, or naked really, who are more associated with nature, something uh, that occurs naturally. And uh, you're kind of beautifully pushing back, obviously, against that, which is obviously an old conceit. Um, but doing it in a way which is very clever in terms of its accessing photography, fashion, and also the history of art and paintings like A Sunday Afternoon on the Island of La Grande Jacques, which I'm sure you uh, saw first when you went to Chicago uh, as an undergrad, you know, the pride of that collection. And of course, it right. never travels. On everything. <laughs> yeah, um, everywhere. But it was very interesting, you know, with that painting and we showed the Manet, um, uh, Edouard Manet. And when I started to, to paint, like he was a really important figure for me because um, like, um, what is the lunch? Uh, what is the translation, the lunch in the garden or whatever the painting that you showed yeah. before? You have this also this relationship, which you, it can only be done in a painting of this strange grounds yes the foreground and the background and like why is the woman appearing um mm. you know in the middle so that painting really really haunted me and disturbed me for years yes and mm. um, and her frontal gaze you know which was something really really uh, amazing and i guess with sarah um uh, sarah works yes you know it's like one thing about art institute it's just for us as uh, undergrads it was amazing that we, our studios were in the back of the Art Institute. So on lunch breaks, you know, when we wanted to discuss a certain work of Georgia Kifi or look at El Greco and so on, you know, we would just go and with a cart and, you know, we would be there. And it was really, really amazing setup, you know, to be able to be so close to the paintings uh, by itself. For example, with this work, when it's reproduced, you think it's this tiny little thing, but it's a huge painting. And yeah. actually, I think the beauty of this painting is the close-ups or, you know, see, like, I really loved how um, Sarah painted the trees as well. Um, yeah. This, I use the spray effect in my works as well, because, it, you know, um, the, with this sense of the economy of painting, which I had discussed with Bernard Fries, a French painter, is like, how do you represent something with a little bit, uh, with a little gesture, but with the most, um, with the most efficiency? And mm. this painting has that, and it's really exactly, funny. exactly. You know, like, look at I the mean, dog, the little monkey. I know. Well, those are all the things which Sondheim loved about it. You know, if you can mention him for a second, since he just passed, um, you know, and got so right in that play. Um, yeah. And also the, the commitment of the artists in making it. 
So uh, that really makes sense. We'll show some examples of some of your sort of splattering that you do on the surface and a little bit in the details. Um, one more work that I wanted to pull out. The only painting I could think of, of uh, female archers from the period who are not Amazons, um, the fair Toxophilite or English archers, 19th century, painting by the great William Powell Frith, Victorian artist of uh, everyday upper class or upper middle class life uh, in Britain. You have to go to Exeter to see it. Um, but it is also a kind of robust, robust image of um, you know, female agency uh, in this work. They're waiting their turn, but they're also shown uh, not as classical archers. And they have all the particular accoutrements of toxophilites, which is a word that I had never heard of, it means someone who pursues archery um, and also the requisite English country house in the background. Great picture. People have never um, heard of it. But in the details of your picture and here, I think you can see some of that spraying going on here and also the wonderful way that you sort of blur the faces. Um, it give them a kind of sense of edginess and uncertainty and this beautiful sort of splay of brush strokes, which make up the fur of her, whatever this is, great big boa around her neck. And then this extravagant use of orange and yellow here, which really pops out of the picture along with the lipstick. And of course they're wearing these uh, bowler hats. So they kind of look like characters out of um, the Emma Peel's world. Uh, and these, these sort of post-war imagery, it's, it's, it's fantastic. I'll put Thank another you. detail and yeah, maybe talk a little bit about your technique. Here. Well, the technique, um, um... I I work, it's always, you know, really when you work with images and not from real life so much, the relationship and then past my, of my work, the, even their interpretation of different painters was, um, was, um, was a tactic or a way of dealing, of learning how, what a painting is. So I had I worked around the works of um, Stryjenska and, um, also um, kind of classical painters uh, from Marczewski area that you're gonna present as well. So it's like, when do you, like how do you work when you have the image and how do you make it more interesting and so on? Mm -hmm. So um, there comes the painting and the painting can be treated, you know, it can be treated flat, it can be treated standing up, it can be leaned down. And also this massive amount of the idea of a brush, the idea of a spray, the idea of a fat paint, thin paint, um, even the spatula, right? So the little knife mm. and so on. So it's just it's just the joy of how you, what do you, how do you want to represent it? For example, as I said in Seurat, I really learned from uh, his work that dealing with this nature, you either you know let the paint do it, or he spent tons of hours on it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so. With, with this painting, I at thought- At night, you only painted at night too, bizarrely, to try to get it as, as iridescent as possible. Yeah, so I tried to be a little modern and then, you know, like stencils come in use, yes? So- Yeah, um, here. So the leaves are, uh, you know, they're in stencil and actually, you know, I have a box of stencils. So sometimes I'm like, mm. oh, that, that will work. And then I do, because I like these kind of medis immediacy like the fastness of the painting then sometimes mm -hmm. I like and also for also you know like a painting is kind of like a discovery so um, um, uh, one teacher of mine he said you know remember that the painting should be always finished so even if you if you are still working on it meaning don't work on just one side like layer the layer the shape in the same time because then maybe you know, the gesture or, or, or the accidental will come the thing. And for example, when you show this apple, this is maybe for our listeners, something interesting. So I use a lot of tape. And by using tape of covering certain objects, like when I'm spraying and so on, um, I can then peel it off. So like with this apple, I really enjoyed that um, the gesture of the tape became, so the background became the foreground. Mm. So yeah, you just thing. pulled that off to reveal those those grasses. I do struggle as a painter, and especially with these huge works that I have for Metro Pictures, how it's proud is like, 
I love turpentine, yes, because right. with turps, you can just flow it, it just yeah. drips and it can, you know, then you lay a paint on it and then it falls down. It just, and even like very little uh, paint can, you know, form a beautiful surface. Mm. And um, I'm going to show you one painting on the end that I did with Liquin, um, which is, you know, which is a popular, I learned that from my painter friends in New York. And um, huh. I, do, I do also with these big works, I do apprenticeships with, um, with artists and painters coming as from Canada, from Montreal to, um, to American painters. I had a few and uh, two students of That's art. in Krakow? Where is that? Uh, in Krakow and from Gdansk, I had some students which we work, you know, then we work together to lay the backgrounds and to lay the setups. And then, you know, we mm -hmm. share also the way of how to deal with painting and form. Right. So from this side, I am a little bit like the old masters that the painting, you know, is uh, conceptualized and done by me, but I let the others to kind of join me in. Mm -hmm. And by, you know, by even, you know, do, dealing with a painting like this, like the forest, uh, the grass and this one, if you can see the movement of how the paint directed the movement from the bottom on the right side, that mm -hmm. I had two people and we were just like, whoo, whoo, yeah. you know, moving the painting <laughs> up and down. And then you need to lay it for the night and leave because the fumes are like, <laughs> the studio is going to blow up. <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, and in this image you can see also like the layers of painting and I think Mehofer had to use tape as well when he was painting the big dragonfly ah. because this is, yes, this is a little bit how, how I, or maybe he papered, he taped it off because when you do this kind of like covering of a painting, then the scale also turns differently. Mm. And yeah. um, and I, you know, I still like the freedom. I do pre collages. Um, now I do more collages on like, you know, with uh, computer manipulations. But still, you know, the accidental is really great. So mm. with this, with this painting, I must say I was really proud of the front, mm. and I really like the little grass attaching. You know, so how do you work with the planes? So the grass um, when it's coming close to the brown dark um, um, blue coat. You can see those little things. Yeah, over and, here. Yeah, yeah, and you know, like with this work, I was working on, on it in the middle of the summer and I thought, you know, it's also one thing of pink, when I look at paintings, like the flatness, the matteness, the, um, do, they, do they use varnish and so on? So sometimes I do use varnish if I want to have the deepness and especially for the darks, it's really good. Mm. But with this, this one, I felt, I felt that I wanted the forest to be really like, you know, coming from almost illustrations. Um, yeah, or like, animation cells, one, one exactly. of the viewers mentioned. It has that so kind of feeling really, and that liquidity. Exactly. So it's done really fast with the sense of, um, yeah, of how you how you can just gesturally put something. But mm. then in the school, the Academy of Fine Arts, we always talked about the contradiction in paintings that, you know, if you have the looseness, have the tightness, yes. Mm. So as the paintings, I like to kind of also decide what is the tightness that I'm gonna have. And of course, in yeah. this one, the fashion and the figures and the kind of spirit of them. And what's uh, the writing here on the tree that sort of burned into the tree? Well, this painting is called Feminist Mycology with reference of um, Deborah Tuberville and an illustrator artist, Cecilia Granata, that I met while I was researching researching works and this humanized mushroom forms, which I thought I really yes. are. Which you can buy from her. At, she's in California as fabric. And they're fantastic. Yes, and as pajamas and all the other different kinds of things. Um, These yes. wonderful cheeky bum shots of mushrooms. And she's a tattoo artist, so we can get one yeah. tattoo, which I'm thinking of getting one. <laughs> but <laughs> so the relationship, the relationship Oops, I can, uh, when I started to work on it, and I, I had done, I have two painting with my college reference. Um, 
one is in the Tate, it's called The Alchemist, and one is um, in a private collection in New York, it's called The Mycologist for my last show, Listeria, Hysteria, Mysteria in Metro Pictures. But um, I call this work feminist mycology because I was, I was kind of thinking, oh, I wonder if mushrooms have a sense of feminist understanding. And then Cecilia's kind of work popped out. And um, so Mycology, by the way, is the study of fungi. Those of you who are not up on your various biological terms, which I, of course, did not know either. <laughs> um, so this this image, and I think you're going to show the image later on, is a, mm -hmm. an Italian um, feminist from 1960s. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, so it says in Italian, solidarity with women's struggles is all over the world. Yes. And um, I think you have it in the States as well, but I don't know. And it's like post-Soviet, like people really just love to engrave their names with knives, you know. So whenever something was public, like mm. a chalet in the mountains, you know, like a shelter, like everybody would just everywhere just engrave their names. Right. So I was kind of imagining the mycologists, you know, where they were taking the rest of like cutting the mushrooms with the knife, but they just wanted to leave this track of feminist symbol. I love this. These these are this is a team of mycologists who are studying fungi um, <laughs> in clothing like it comes out of succession and uh, with these fabulous hats. It's just it's it's super creative. Um, just a few details, some of this wonderful working of the medium you see there this uh beautiful treatment of the face uh, a little bit scowling in profile on the left and then this very liquid use of the paint and this one you're using acrylic and oil together right yes it's like the acrylic oil and a spray is a part of it so yeah. i use like yeah. acrylic spray and sometimes car spray um yeah <laughs> And I'm thinking of and, there's something else hidden. I mean, it gives it the quality of a watercolor, even though it's gigantic, gigantic. it's a huge painting, you know, but it has that kind of feel. Yes. Uh, here's another painting in the first room, House Proud from 2021, which I, I call the post ABBA painting. Um, and this image of these four uh, figures against this wall um, with this graffito or this graffiti uh, that goes across the wall and then somehow enters the sky, which is a, a wonderful sort of surrealist touch here on the left. Um, you know, the eighties will never leave us, uh, but this kind of style that you see here. Um, and uh, here's a detailed shot of this graffiti. Where is this wall? Paulina? This is in, uh, this is in Ukraine. And I was, um, I have a Ukrainian friend and she's living now in California, but she goes back to Kiev. And we were just discussing so often in, in her work. She's an artist as well and a painter. We, uh, we just discussed how much this beautiful method that, you know, existed since Italy. This graffito is a method that you uh, dig into, into a, not dry cement. So the cement has to be like really fresh. And then if you, you, you do levels of color cement, so the deeper you get. So it's, if you go really deep, I think in this one, which was the red, if you don't go so deep, you have the blue and so on. So it's yeah, like these here. layers of how, how do you control the knife? And I learned that in the Academy of Fine Arts in Gdansk. Um, and this method is disappearing. Um, so um, Jana uh, Verba, my friend, she is trying to photograph a lot of the pictures and to make them, um, you know, to make those visible because in some years they could be completely gone. And mm. this is why I wanted to juxtapose it with the 80s fashion, which is coming from, um, from a Polish um, photographer, Jacek Sobieszewski. And um, I guess, yeah, I just guess I wanted with this, with this idea that it doesn't end, that it kind of enters, you know, into this own new vision of what yeah. a script could be. But um, yeah, and a lot of my work is, um, I try to pinpoint this idea of taste so what is the taste of 80s like? What is our relationship with the 80s kind of fashion now? And um, and what is the sense, what, what is the place for this graffito's work from um, socialist countries um, or ceramic uh, tiles and so on? So what do, you, what do we treat as something great, but it fades with fashion, but maybe it can come back to fashion as well. So, yeah. 
Yeah, and it's a nice tribute to the, you know, the roots of Metro Pictures, which was founded, of course, in 1980 in Soho on Mercer Street, um, when people were walking around like this in Punity, um, you yes. know, back in the day. Helene you know, had some pictures from that era. <laughs> yes, I bet. I bet. Um, just to call some attention to some of the impasto work here on the, um, on the band around the waist of the woman that you see there on the right to give you a sense of the variety of the picture making. And then here's another stencil at the top right, which is giving you not a scent, not leaves, but um, a much more uh, ripping uh, quality. Capitalism also depends on domestic labor. Sure. All the English way. Well, you know, also, you know, from my perspective, a lot of those walls, when I see, when I travel and I, traveled um, a couple of years ago, uh, often to Minsk, to Belarus, is that you see that they have this graffiti and the, you know, the uh, decay as a part of it. Mm. So, mm. so this, uh, this one is coming also from because the house proud and just to come back to the title and um, the whole rela relationship with women run spaces is put together in a small film and a show, which we're gonna leave for our viewers to come and still, you know, see it. But it's really, mm -hmm. it's a collage image with a lot of kind of posters and statements from like since 1960s to 80s to 2000s of women run initiatives. Yeah, women art collectives and schools and initiatives. Um, it's a it's a terrific short video which tells you gives you kind of capsule history of these activities uh, essentially since the Second uh, World War and with some some titling and, and uh, content in the content. Um, one other work in the first room and then we'll move to the back room. This one in black with roses on 24th from the same year 2021 uh, oil on canvas which um, you know is is a work which is more to a degree, in a sense, related to your earlier stuff with this single figure kind of fashion plate uh, imagery. This woman who is, I should have mentioned before, you know, the idea of a female archer relates to the Amazons. And the Amazon was a uh, name that the French gave to women uh, who were out on the street and seemed very boisterous and, and, uh, and socially adept, et cetera. Um, and also on horseback, interesting. A terminology, but this idea of this woman who looks quite gargantuan in this painting as she's striding down the very street that um, Metro Pictures is located on uh, with a, a beautiful bouquet of flowers um, and sort of tipping her hat and looking very stylish and uh, here in much nicer weather than we have at present. Um, but in black with roses, does this derive from a particular photograph? Yes. Um... It's coming from my collection from 1980s, um, French Vogue's, mm -hmm. and they're all ripped apart because I put a lot of images on the walls and then I kind of, you know, um, think or meditate on them. And sometimes images I have lying mm -hmm. like the house prior to the 1980s uh, painting really didn't make sense uh, when I thought with this juxtapose of Scraffito and as he said, of the history of the opening of Metro and what, what, what was this fashion. So mm. this image, this image was the last image that I painted, and I had to rush to paint it because transport was coming, and from Krakow to New York is a long way. So yep. that's where I use liquid, and um, yeah, and I just wanted to say that it has this different way, like a lusciousness of painting, which you can see in the, like at the bottom, um, the ground what she's walking into, but there's a thickness mm. to it as well, and yeah, yeah. for me. Um, it is a relationship, but I can tell you all as a secret. It's like it's based loosely on Carla Bruni. <laughs> but uh, okay. I, I think I wasn't, I was like, oh my God, it's not a car, about Carla Bruni, but I thought this the idea of a black and the idea how in fashion what the black stands for, and you know, this mm -hmm. rushing in for the last less uh last opening. Because at the end, you know, we all love openings as well. And this is what Chelsea is about. It's like mm -hmm. how the experience shows how we go from one to another. And I was house proud that actually on the last day, uh, on the opening day in the evening, we managed to have music and disco in the, in the gallery with the paintings. And that was really fabulous, you know, on this, um, on this last time that the walls hear the music in relationship to 
to the painting. So, um, so this is the first work that you see when you enter the gallery, but also the last work that you see. It's two mm. large rooms. Um, and I wanted to, to have this also feeling like, is it the beginning or is it the end? Is she rushing in? Where is she rushing in? And just yeah. for the reference of the background, because the background is collaged from, uh, from ooh, um, funny to say, but Google images, because I should ask my friend Jake from Metro to send me a picture, but <laughs> it, sometimes you paint in the rush, as you say, in the middle of the night. So I was like, oh, I'm going to Google find it. And I did, and I misinterpreted it. So I put 24th Street around Metro. And the side Far of west. Fashion, yes, popped out. And I was like, oh, I don't remember Metro having red brick. But I was like, fine, let's just do the red because I like the red with the red and the roses. So then when I look closely, I was like, oh, there is a label. So of the gallery. So instead, I thought it's better when she just takes the bus. <laughs> so there is a, uh, like one, my favorite part is the relationship with the roses and the color and like the, uh, mm. you know, the angular composition with the bust up on the end. Yeah, terrific. Yeah, and, and she has a real monumentality, you know, a kind of presence. And it made me thinking about, you know, how in fashion photography, uh, even if it wasn't happening in painting, especially in modernist painting, giving women a kind of sense of power and agency. And, you know, it does have a traditional basis, just a couple examples, Frederick Layton's portrait of May Sartoris, uh, which is in the Kimball in Fort Worth. And then John Singer Sargent's Mr. and Mrs. Ian Phelps Stokes, where Mr. Stokes is very much a secondary character to his vivacious uh, American wife. This is a painting at the Met. And that idea of you know, fashion and agency and power and um, self-assurance, you know, which you're channeling in, in these present works. Um, and they collapse time in a really uh, beautiful way. Um, is there something about this? I have a question from G.E. Schwartz, um, which feels like nostalgic. You know, it, do you, are you thinking about these things as sort of nostalgic? Because I look at the painting at the right, and Carla Bruni, obviously, you know, she she is uh, she's in her fifties now, but um, you know, it, it feels timeless in a way. This image on the right, and I think that is something that is really effective in your work that you can find these pointers which recall the past but at the same time it, it brings us into a, a kind of social present well exactly i thank you and thank you for the question because nostalgia is a complicated term yes but just to give you just to give you maybe an answer why i was dealing with nostalgia is because mm -hmm. i had a duality of um, of my education and my upbringing. So my uh, my mother uh, is Polish, but my father immigrated to US when I was really small in the times of solidarity. So in uh, around 86 or 87. Mm -hmm. So I always was in between places. And so it gave me a perspective, like what am I missing? Or what maybe, what is something that I'm, um, I'm seeing that the, the place could have. And being Eastern European and growing in this moment of a change, yes, of um, that suddenly in Warsaw and in Poland, everything that belonged to socialism and everything that belonged to a certain history was erased. Um, and in my work, in my early work especially, I was trying to say, wait a moment, are you really sure you want to, you know, destroy all the neons, destroy this, you know, beautiful architecture, posters, they don't mean anything to you right now. So I think art has this beauty of being a above you know also propaganda and we can have another look at it and it was you know like you know this discussion also shall we remove all the statues right like the lenin and marx and so on so and what do we do with architecture so this is the question so it's a really this nostalgia i always say that i work with nostalgia because it's a very present still topic so what i'm trying to say is like wait a moment let's have another look at it Let's through my shows have a, another look at it. What do we think, or what do we miss, or what could be, you know, like in a in a video, like really slow down, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think being uh, looking in the past is as much as interesting as looking to the future and uh, yeah. and relating to the present. So I really treat nostalgia as a as a language that you can speak about the present to give a certain perspective. 
mm. because you know painting yeah. is nostalgic by itself. Yeah, the second you make it, but uh, <laughs> that is true. And and I love the way that it translates to New York. You know, I mean, that's a really fascinating element that all of this seems sort of strangely familiar, even if we can't place it. And certainly, I couldn't place a lot of the references that you're putting in there, but it all feels kind of straightly familiar and filtered through, you know, different periods and cultures. Uh, just one more and then I'll move to this uh, other works. I love this painting. This is in the second room now, the back room at um, Metro Pictures, The Agriculturist from 2021. Um, I love a painting with Highland cattle in it. You can't beat that. Um, these woolly beasts you see uh, everywhere, especially out in Scotland and in Northern England. Um, with this uh, jaunty bells around his uh, or her neck and uh, and uh, touch of color. And then this woman who, who is, she is built for agriculture and farming, obviously, in this outfit and this hat. <laughs> um, yes, so and, this, yep. uh, I just wanted to say about the agriculture. So in the back room yeah. of Metro, the metaphor becomes, so you see singular uh, figures besides the hybrid, which hybrid is a creature by its own. Um, mm -hmm. The relationship becomes about the special task or the special knowledge. So each of those paintings that you see, the, the, the representative figure have a knowledge. And like the agriculturist, you know, she, um, um, you know, the, she has the, she knows about agriculture. That's why she can be so fancily dressed as well, because mm -hmm. she knows how to do agriculture. And I, you know, for my past uh, couple of shows, especially in the last show and um, Metro Visteria, Hysteria, Wisteria, I started to really think of animals and representation of animals in paintings. So uh, it's maybe also because my studio is outside of Krakow. So I do have a relationship with maybe not dragons that you see on the right side, but definitely with cows. And um, yeah, I'm just fascinated. Like, yeah. it's great to paint animals. Let's see some of these. So there's this fabulous sort of pseudo triptych of works that confront you when you enter the um, the back room. And I, I like you're talking about their specialists. So they all betray a kind of confidence in their pose, their posture, their gaze, and the elements that surround them. So the one on the left is this one, Esther Krombachova in Krombachova in her office, you'll say it better than me, from 2021, uh, which is a remarkable, uh, very um, uh, direct image of this woman who is an important mover and shaker in Polish culture. Well, she's actually Czech, uh, Jason. Oh, Czech. Oh, sorry. Yes, that's but, right. You know, we, we Czech and Poles are really close. And I, um, you know, it's, it, it comes also this, um, this relationship with a figure comes because I was living and working in Prague and in the, in the academy. So I was, uh, of course, like a little bit researching about the background. But it mm. also comes through, uh, through the films that I think my work um, started to have understanding like, what do I want to do with my work? Which was the film Daisies by Vera Hitilova, which is about two women that they live, you know, they just wake up in surrealist Prague and in 1960s and they don't know what to do. So they kind of go and play tricks in town by like absurd tricks. Like they play with food. They, they're nasty and mean and naughty basically. And then, you know, years after, so last year, um, um, uh, we got a little note uh, with the, from, uh, oh, Jason, you wrote that note with the correct spelling. So later I discovered that actually all the sets were something that I was really into the, in the, into the film. And actually the outfits were something that inspired me and behind it, it was Esther Krumbahova. So in this painting, um, and sometimes I don't do that very often, but the more, uh, the more I see a possibility of a portraiture, like, you know, the portraying of the 24th Street um, and the portraiture of Esther Krumbahava, I thought, yes, I can have one figure that I want to relate to. And it's a loose interpretation. It's not the portrait, but um, yes, Esther was very known from 1960s of wearing these gigantic glasses. And in that room, I had to put her in with the reference uh, to all the posters that she was either the set designer or the screenwriter. 
So we have Valerie in the Years of Wonder. And I wish I could write you all those films because they're so good. So The Daisies is a must for everybody to see. Um, I think it's even free on YouTube. Fruits of Paradise, super bizarre. And um, what is it? Uh, Hunting for Witches. Oh, that goes, you know, like just uh, when you type in Esther Krumbahova and check uh, New Wave, all those things come up. And I, I really feel, you know, we speak a lot of the French New Wave and the mm. French film, but this, oh, those checks, I tell you, the, the films are just fabulous. And yeah, on the right, you had chose uh, a very nice uh, detail, uh, Jason, um, with the open scissors. So um, the open scissors come from my, you know, I do add a little bit of um, symbolism from, from a, 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 a hermetic knowledge. They come for the idea of a change, but also the ambitiousness of, you know, protection. Mm. And, you know, she's a fashion, you know, she did uh, the costumes and the fashion. So, of course, I thought the scissors must be there. Sometimes, you know, just so you know, like sometimes I research, sometimes they come very quickly, the symbols to put yeah. in. So, the bell, um, the All candle. the lit candles, yes. all the lit candles here. Yeah. But I think if you see, the, you see where the candles are coming from, because The Haunting for Witchcraft, the film, yeah. which is so brutal as well. Um, yeah, and this is where the skull is coming from. It's like, it's all kind of lit by candles in a way. Right, right. And who, yes. you know, the Holy Mary is like, it's such a hard symbolism. I, I had one show in Hong Kong when I had a lot of images in ceramic in relationship to Holy Marys and like women yeah. of as saints. And it's still like such a potential, like, you know, how can you, how can you work with religion? It's not this a patri patriarchal system. So mm. that's why I thought that Holy Mary kind of works with the sense of, you know, everyone who was in Prague knows how there is, it's so thick and crackled too with images yeah. of the representation of um, saints. Also, and, it, it is lends to the whole Gothic atmosphere, not exactly. just her dress, but also the, the content of the films for which she was costume designer. It all works yeah. well. And the, the painting that it made me think of is this one by John Singer Sargent of Isabella Stewart Gardner. And that idea of a woman sort of enmeshed in the environment, uh, the world that she creates. And Sargent, to his credit, didn't do, do that in the painting, but knew that it would be displayed in the Gardner Museum in Boston. And she would be sort of, you know, in the midst of all the, the world that she created there in that magical house museum. Um, and it also has a, a, the quality of a religious icon, that painting, it, which I think that. comes out strongly in yours. Sorry, go Thank ahead. Thank you. That's such a great juxtaposition. I'm so, I was proud. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, there you go. Yeah. So we need to check out some of these Czech modern movies. The thing that her her her, her glasses made me think of uh, in Polish culture was Ashes and Diamonds, which is like oh, the yeah. first movie that anyone who ever studies Polish film or Eastern film watches. And that <laughs> sunglasses where you can see the eyes, which was such a weird thing when I saw that movie. That's by Wajja. Um, great film from 1958, Ashes and Diamonds. Uh, just quickly hybrid, and then I want to move through the rest of the thing and open us up to uh, questions. Uh, hybrid, this extraordinary painting, which has something to do with the occult and Aleister Crowley and is in a totally different stylistic vein, much more of a kind of poster uh, aesthetic, but with these Kirsten Dunst-like faces um, who also seem to inhabit some kind of uh, 1950s, 1960s um, aesthetic, and then all these arcane symbols, which I'm sure it would take a long time to unpack. In fact, there's really helpful information at the gallery in a pamphlet that you can read when you look at all this material. But here you're working in a very different mode yeah. in this painting. Yeah, I um, well, I, I kind of, you know, thinking of Metro and thinking of womanhood and so on, it was also kind of like, sometimes the symbols are coming to me, so-called. So yeah. I was looking at the, um, at the tarot cards of uh, Aleister Crowley, and yeah. I picked up the first card was called art, yes, and it was the hybrid. So I'm just going to read you um, the from uh, uh, 
uh, the quote in, in the middle of the, um, of the uh, aura in the background. So which said, visit the interior of the earth and by um, recitifying what you find there. So I understand uh, like by when you go and research it and uh, what you find there, you will discover the hidden philosophical stone. And then I just thought, what a beautiful metaphor. How do you create art that you need the opposites? You need the white lion, the red eagle, which are also symbols of um, the opposites, but also of the lovers. And then, you know, you have the stars, you just need everything, but you need a dual kind of person to make it happen. And then I thought, oh, how great it, you know, in a faraway metaphor, it kind of relates to Helene and Janelle opening the Metro picture and becoming those mm. two women that they start to mix fire and water and relationship into a creation of, of an art form. And for me, it stands like from the feminist perspective, for me, it's really interesting that how do you create art um, and the opposite of like the artist is the genius that you can create art as the, um, you know, as, a, um, as an artist of friendship. So for mm -hmm. me, this is a pretty sense of friendship and sharing ideas to, to, cre to create something really meaningful. So even though it was, and sometimes, you know, as an artist, like I just don't want to keep on, you know, I could keep on doing my stand and sell the same method. And I'm, but with this one, I thought, why not? I'm going to try to, you know, interpret the tarot card. Like, why mm -hmm. not, you know, use this as the background of the painting? And I did really enjoy it as well. So if you see it in real, you will see how nicely, you know, the, you know, like um, the different parts of the paintings are. So, yeah, um, I would choose like that would be my favorite painting of the show. Yeah, this part feels like tesserae mosaics when you look yeah. at it closely, and then you know the, the 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 smoothness of it is consistent throughout, but it changes. It's nonetheless has a great deal of variety. Uh, the last picture on this wall is this one: the principal and her pet from 2021. Again, as all these works are, and this extraordinary stark image of a woman with a, what else, dragon on a leash, as one does, another candle in the background, some interesting paintings, and I'll have you talk about this, but the one work that it reminded me of was um, this picture by, you mentioned him before, uh, Mashevsky, uh, Medusa from 1900, um, one of the artists most associated with Polish symbolism in the turn of the century, and uh, grandiose paintings, not really history paintings, although he did dip into that sometimes, but with these sort of really direct gazes and this uh, image of the, the Gorgon from classical mythology uh, in a absolutely 1900 mode there on the right. Exactly. So I, um, you asked me in the beginning how much they influenced me, like seeing Malczewski's work is like, it's really, I haven't seen a similar painter in symbolism as Malczewski. So um, mm. Dear listeners, whoever comes to Krakow, or if you're close to Berlin or you know Prague, do see the classical paintings um, mm. in the museum. I would even more recommend the Krakow Museum because it has more symbolism and just more folk-related images. But uh, Malczewski's use of um, you know the female as the metaphor, as the siren, as the muse, as the tempter, uh, temptationist was, yeah, it was something that I thought, whoa, this guy is going wild. <laughs> yeah. So in a way it permitted me, you know, because now um, it's, I think it's um, 15 years that I'm living in Krakow before um, my, you know, different kind of studies and places that I lived before. The dragon, like the representation of a dragon is also the prima materia, the something that, um, that comes as a friend, as a pet, as a, um, as a, also like a bit of a sexual symbol. I thought it's really great. And, um, you know, the, the, the Krakow's uh, symbol is the dragon because, um, Jason, I'll show you a couple pictures of that here. Yes, let's show the uh, Krakow dragon. So this is the sculpture, but the dragon lived under the castle and it actually wanted to eat the princess in the castle, but there was a shipyard who made this fake sheep, which was full of 
a gasoline and benzene and the <laughs> dragon had ate it and it blown out. Yes, so that was the story, but I thought in my painting, the dragon is doing good with the princess, yes, the principia. And the principia discordia, the principal as we call in the schools and so on, in her office, I just kind of thought, um, you know, every school has a principal. So voila, this is my principal. And she's surrounded with symbols of the dragon. And uh, over the top, maybe you can tell the dragon is kind of a loose flying dragon. It's from an ancient, mm -hmm. actually a fresco, Roman fresco. So what I did with this painting, I just started to research dragon representations. And I think in the next picture, you zoom in with um, my favorite, um, what is this stone, which is, oh, oh here's a ve vegan Kit Kat. And this was, this was a drama because first I started to paint M&Ms and then I found out that those vegan Kit Kats exist. And I'm like, the dragon needs to eat Kit Kat. Um, but uh, there is also the relationship. Oh, this, yes. So it's a Chinese um, sculpture of what is, uh, what is the material like mahogany? Mm, um, it's a wood? Super, uh, no, it's like, it's, it's like teeth. Okay. Oh, anyway, like teak, yeah. teak. Like, yes, it's like you know this, this like something like a marvel. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, in real, um, and but it's uh, what it is is the monk cleaning the teeth of the dragon, and I thought what a great right. interpretation of um, of the dragon <laughs> relationship with the human, with the you know because we have the classical Saint George and the dragon, but this relationship mm -hmm. of looking into and this dragon is very um, what is it never ending story, isn't it? <laughs> Right. Yeah. You know, you have a lot of choices when it comes to dragons, right? You can go the Donatello route in his Predella of St. George in Florence, which yours is kind of close to, which looks like a sort of stumpy beast, not really that scary. Or you can go the yeah. J.R. Tolkien route, you know, the, the Peter Jackson, massive, huge, scary dragon, which we kind of associate in Western culture. But here, you know, I think still, if you were a student who was sent to the principal to this office, you would be a little intimidated by a dragon there behind uh, behind the desk. You wanna get your act together academically. And also she has this marvelously fierce gaze in addition to platform shoes. Don't miss those at the bottom. So again, this sort of fashion sort of plays in here and the glove and it's such a, it's such a startling and uh, engaging picture. I, that, I mean, one thing that I really loved about this work, even though initially I was a little at sea, just looking at it in terms of the reference, is that they really grab you and they pull you in and you, you want to unpack them. They're, they're interesting on so many different uh, levels. And part of that is, of course, to do with this, the, the powerful gazes that you give uh, these figures, which in other contexts, would you say, sort of almost relates to a kind of blank gaze that you often do see in photog fashion photography, that sort of neutral blank gaze, but they don't read like that here because of all the elements that surround them. Yeah, well, you know, with Esther Krumbahava, like it's uh, the frontal gaze, and you know it from painting that to paint somebody frontal, I think it comes also because even in, if you photograph, if you don't have a model, this like, mm. I know you, I, I see you having contact with me, is the hardest. So mm. in my earlier work, I preferred to have, you know, like all different ways of dealing with the face, but because it was the most tempting, I started to work with that as well. Um, you yeah. know, what does it do to the painting? But it, I tell you, it's the hardest thing. It's like really, it's hit and miss as well. Yeah. All right, so one final work, and then we'll look at some questions. Just to note the small vi the video, which is here in this room on the other side of the room, House Proud, uh, which has this co collation of images of female art projects and collaborative uh, exchanges. And then uh, on the wall next to the agriculturalist, you have this, the most curious image, I think, in the show. Um, it's called The Cleaners, which is like a play on uh, Millet's The Gleaners. Um, Jean-Francois <laughs> Jean Millet's The Gleaners. Of course, they're, they're workers of a kind. Uh, from 2021, oil on canvas, this image of three women, uh, two who are visible, uh, with, a, with uh, broomsticks and, uh, and, and pots, or the sort of um, cleaning pans. So we'll just end with this. I'll let you talk about this a little bit. Please enlighten yeah, us as to what's going to on here. Explicit. 
as well. So um, <laughs> yeah, but I think, you know I think the difference for the viewers if when you come and see the show it becomes anecdotal because of the more images you see around. So um, yeah, you know, like this is the beauty of like really working with presence and nostalgia that this painting it has this, you know, other aura around where you know that actually it's about the two women, you know, cleaning the space and moving on. And the beauty of yeah, a representation of jobs as well, like, you know, any school, any institution needs the cleaners. And, and I, I think we, you know, we need to pay respect for them and they, res mm. you know, they need, um, I just kind of thought we cannot live without the cleaners as a representation of a community as well. Yeah, so, domestic also, labor. Yes, also yeah. because I love the fashion and um, I remember when I was in Moscow still a couple of years ago, you know, when you go to the Red Square and you see the woman with the brooms, you know, wearing the headscarves and so on. It's just like, and a big puffy jacket. It's, it's, mm. I think it's my favorite kind of like, a beautiful morning dance, you know, with the sound and so on. So, and actually this, this reference photograph is coming, um, maybe you can see it, it's coming from a fashion show. So I juxtapose and play with this image of the cleaners on a catwalk, yes? So in fashion, the idea of the, you know, of the dirty look also became a film, a thing with Comte de Garçon, Ray Capacabo, and so on. So I mm -hmm. wanted to, you know, play on that as well. Yeah, and this idea of, you know, fashionably dressing as a, a person of labor, you know, it makes me think of Marie Antoinette at Le Petit Hameau, that, that little village that she had built at Versailles so that she could dress up as a peasant and fit into the lower class life. Uh, between meals at the at the Grand Chateau, um, but I love also this little uh, so you know that sense of pleasure and that kind of knowing glance on the figure in the back, whereas models on the runway are usually not meant to kind of break containment and show emotion, right? But here, you know, I think that's a, a beautiful way to end the show um, and to you know characterize your relationship with the gallery and and the uh, the owners of the gallery um, and that sense of the pleasure you know that that is involved in this whole industry uh, which we're involved in, involved with um thank you so much paulina for uh talking to us today um everyone please if you can get to the exhibit uh which closes on saturday it is endlessly fascinating um figuration is back um artists are doing remarkable things with it um, and we just try to give you a little window into the range of reference in these kinds of works. And whether it's John Curran's pictures or Lisa Yuskevich or, you know, this is where uh, things are happening and the culture is changing um, in both the medium of painting still remarkably and in uh, figuration. So uh, kudos to you, Paulina. Thank you so much for uh, joining us from Scandinavia. Um, I will and stop. I just want to thank you for this wonderful juxtaposition with images. It's so, even for me, refreshing and, um, and amazing. So thank you for um, all your research and on your inputs to the work. My pleasure. It's great fun. Thank you. So I'll turn it over to Nick. Well, I'll, I'll likewise thank you both for such a wonderful conversation. And this has been so rich and, and um, so Wonderful. So thank you. And, you know, by extension, again, thank you to Metro Pictures for everything they've done here and for many, many years. Um, before I pass the mic off, um, I wanted to read a comment from our friend Tamara Gonzalez, who had to leave, but um, another great, interesting reference to the, uh, the work with um, Taro that T Tamara said, uh, to mention that the Crowley deck was painted by a woman, the Lady, Fr the, the, sorry, the Lady Frida Harris. So, um, another great reference there. But uh, I'll post a, a link in there, uh, in the chat. Sorry. Uh, but I'm going to pass the mic first to our friend G. E. Schwartz to ask our first question. Thank you, thank you, Nick, and thank you, Jason and Paulita. I've struck. Looking at these, um, especially these high glossy fashionable kind of takes, is that it, 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 and a question about a, a trauma that seems to be underneath it all. 
and and looking at the work, it seems as though I was reminded of um, of two artists. One is the indigenous artist Freddie Taylor um, um, of Canada, who who is working through the the deep trauma of his people in our society, and also of Mike Kelly. Um, both seem to have made a kind of cosmos um, resulting from the kind of trauma that they went through, uh, brought on by provincial and cultural um, education. And I was wondering if, if, if working through these and these subjects that you have, is your approach to using them um, and, and trauma in a similar way in any way? Uh, thank you for your question. I didn't think so much of trauma, but I, I would say of like haunting and like haunting subjecthoods um, as well. And, um, you know, just remember that when I started to paint, like even painting figurative was traumatic, yes, because um, um, even in the Art Institute, like the people that I mentioned, like Paula Rego, who, you know, finally she has a beautiful retrospective in the Tate, and finally, people are saying, wow, she's amazing, or Dorothea Tenning, um, or like people like uh, Emma Kunz and, you know, like um, artists that were dealing with spirituality, you know, they, they were off the radar. So, um, so I think um, um, I, I don't, it's hard for me to say as a painter, like if I find it traumatic, I found it much more like retrospective by looking from the outside, as I said, to experience it. Um, Freddie Taylor's work, I don't know so much, but Mike Kelly's, and we had this discussion and he was an important artist for me. He was in Metro Pictures um, um, before he passed away. And we talked about it and his way of dealing, I guess with symbolism is what really um, attracted me to the, to the work. Like, you know, how do you work with, the popular images. And that's why, you know, you can see the Kit Kat next to an Italian painted dragon as well. And how do you put that on the same plate, you know, on the same plane, I wanted to say. So I'm going to think about that more. <laughs> Thank you um, about the traumatic, but I did went through a certain trauma of a system change with really, um, excuse my language, but it really played with this you know, um, my mind. So, you know, growing up in like still communist Poland, re learning Russian and being 10 years old, I was told that whatever I learned, um, sorry, I was 16, as, as 10, I first time went to the United States with my, uh, with my mom. I was told that we learned from the wrong perspective, yes. And the history that we learned was wrong. And as a child, I, I was like, wait a moment, so what I was just learning was wrong. So we are not learning Russian, there were teachers being fired and now, you know, we, the books are gonna be thrown out. So this was for sure traumatic. And then coming to the States and seeing that what I was learning had no relevance, that it was learning from a super different perspective, yes. So this was something, this was something really important for me and then the separation of my parents so my father stayed in, uh, in the US and he's still living in in Florida and my mom had returned to Poland so the separation of the two and that's why I like to have in my work this this broadness of um, of symbols coming from both cultures so you sometimes see as graffito coming from like post-communist countries and then you see, you know, a more pop imagery like, yeah, the 24th street is becoming, you know, emblematic and so on. So I like, I just like, you know, that's the beauty of the collage as well. And I think of my work as collaging, as laying things that you just question that what does one thing against the other? Oh, I completely understand that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, GE. Thank you, Paulina, for that response. Uh, next, I'm going to pass the mic over to my colleague, Cal. Thank you, Nick. This has been such a wonderful conversation. You, two of you have weaved such a rich tapestry of references, um, which leads me to my, my question, which is that what have you been reading? What have you been watching? What have you been listening to? Are there art historical um, uh, tidbits that excite you? that will lead into your next work is, is I'm just curious what, are, what you've been consuming. Yeah, so definitely, 
Yes, definitely. Mark Fisher ontology is uh, something that I want to because it broads the sense with uh, which uh, thank you for the question you brought of nostalgia. So by repetition or a resonance like how and uh, Mark Fisher used it in the music sense like how do you bring the beat back and I'm thinking like how in painting how do you bring the symbols the you know the color how do you bring figuration back yes with our sense I mean what Jason had showed so beautifully is like this whole history of and that's what I love about historical uh, paintings as well because I was just in Bern Museum in Switzerland, and I was talking to the curator, um, uh, how do you deal with 17th century painting now, but in relationship to the present, and you can't do that, because there is so much in the paintings that, you know, it just, it just has a life of its own. And, uh, and this is why I love to see my paintings in different, you know, environments, and, um, you know, sometimes museums and so on that it gives me this back, but we haven't really covered it. And with the show in New York is a very specific painting show. But what I like to do is performances as well, when then I really activate. So my, um, my muses, my figures, and the people that I work with as performers, they become the act of reinterpretation of a you know, certain historical a thing like the new thing that I'll be working for. And if somebody is close to Chicago with the Art Institute of Chicago, so I'm going back, um, will be with nymphs, with the aspects of nymphs, which I'm sure like uh, Jason could tell us so much about as well. So um, yeah, there, um, and so whenever I kind of pick a topic, I just also, that's the beauty of, you know, like researching that then the research comes to you and so on. Uh, so, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm excited to see you tackle Mark Fisher. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Cal. And thank you, Paulina, for that little sneak peek into what is to come. Um, it's our tradition to pass the mic over to the Rails' own Fong H. Bui for the final question. So Fong, handing the mic over to you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Paulina. I'm sorry I was in and out because there was, you know, phone meeting and whatnot. But I enjoyed your work over the years. And um, since I've been reading so much about the history of American pragmatism, uh, which is so contingent on how to re rectorate or redeploy some idea of education and not making it into a, <laughs> a overwhelmingly um, industry. You know, it need to be private tended or personally personalized in some way or another, beginning with children really. Uh, but so I've been reading a great deal of John Dewey, of course, Reading John Dewey led me to uh, his teacher, William James. And one of the things about James, since I already have read, read years ago, The Principle of Psychology, a very important book, is that both him and his brother, William James, there's a common say that one, the thing about the James brother <laughs> is that one writes psychology books that read like a novel, and the other write novels that read like psychology books. So bring to the question I have, which sometimes I bring it up to other friends when I have a chance to. For example, recently, two months ago, when I interviewed John Curran for The Rail, uh, who started out in graduate school being an abstract expressionist inspired painter. He was making terrific the Kunin-like painting. He threatened to show me one of that he kept and survived. And there's other people who've done that, of course, we can't help but bring to my Gerhard Richter, who able to do both representational painting while making abstract painting. My question to you, Polina, have you ever started out as an abstract painter in some way? I know I, there are, yeah, that's the that's question. You're reading into the uh, future. <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, I say always, if I'm going to be in my 80s, I'm going to get into the abstract work. Uh, so I did, you know, I did work on, because I also like to work with painting as this idea of a stage set, or the idea of narration, 
So for Salzburg exhibition, when I was doing with dance and dance and sound, I worked with this sense of abstract work, but also uh, and the paintings itself, there is so like, you know, this is what Jason had, you know, zoomed into that there is so much of abstraction itself, you know, painting a pattern. Yeah. It's like, you really just go on and so on. And this is what I really love in, in the works itself that it can become, it can become an abstract painting. And, but going back to Carl's uh, um, question, like, Emmy Silman's book, uh, how she wrote, uh, she writes about, you know, how do you start a painting and uh, where those painting leads you is something really uh, inspirational. So like secretly under the table, I do look at, and I admire abstraction very much. And um, one of my next projects will be for Whitechapel in London right now. Um, I was being asked to curate actually the collection that I'm visiting now in Norway. So uh, Kristen Sven's collection. And I'm looking at this, you know, how, from Howard Hodgkins to, you know, to Christopher Wool's abstraction and so on. And I'm like, oh, I can, you know, I can fill the room with that right now. But I'm turning it into the scenic set. A set, a set. So I'm not going to give you the secret what I'm going to turn the paintings where they are. But I'm doing I'm doing the background painting for the abstractions in a sense. <laughs> so um, I don't know if that answers your questions, but um, yes, it's a it's gonna come. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's terrific. You have a beautiful collection in the background of uh, your office or studio. I would like to zoom um, in with that. <laughs> the art in Greenpoint. There's a lot of art here and books. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. One day I visit. <laughs> Thank yes. you. Thank you, Paulina, and congratulations on the show. And Thank uh, you. back to Nikki. Thank you, Jason. And I can't wait for Gia to read. Hello. Grazie mille. Thank you, Fong. Um, and thank you, Paulina, for more uh, details of what, what is to come in the in the following years. Um, we have another tradition here at the rail of closing our community events with a poetry reading and i am thrilled to welcome our poet laureate of the day gia gonzalez to the stage a poet in new york city where she was born and former co-curator of the seg reading series gia gonzalez's work has most recently appeared in no issue femscapes and bomb cyclone and variously with the, po the poetry project her first chat book is forthcoming from portable press at yo-yo labs she is the managing editor at Nightboat Books. Uh, Gia, the stage is yours. Great, thank you. I just want to um, add my thanks uh, to you, Paulina and Jason, for uh, the conversation and for this opportunity and invitation to really immerse myself in your work this afternoon. Um, I had to enter the meeting a little bit late uh, because of a work meeting, but uh, just having the opportunity to sit with your paintings has been such a um, wonderful respite, uh, an engrossing respite from the work day. <laughs> um, and thank you, of course, also to the Brooklyn Rail for inviting me to close out the event. I'm really happy um, to be taking part in this tradition. Um, so I'll be reading from two uh, sets of prose poems. They're short um, and it's a form I found myself drawn to as of late. Um, they're decidedly works in progress, um, but I'll be starting by reading from some poems I've been writing in response to research I've been doing into uh, the production of American exploitation films in the Philippines in the 1970s. Um, and then I'll be reading some poems which are uh, closer to home back in the domestic space. Green, scared, and pretty. There's a red-white disambiguation in the virgin landscape, my little white doll who bathes in tainted water. Yet something of self-knowledge, the unworried concoction of aerosol hair gaudies a tableau. An ecstasy of shock on the colonial caning. The butch, the naive, and the mousy panai surrounding her aroused her white agony, cut to the butch who wipes her finger on her shirt beyond the pale. Of her complexion, she was taught that with it, this green goes. She was built like a tank in drabs, 
and her face was undone, though the unbecoming mark upon it was popularly said to indicate beauty. The rich landscape aflame cheaply. So paid the brown boy was made to throw himself with vigor against the glass, a carabao chewing distantly on a long frond. By this logic, first defiled, then exploded, is a fate not so much to be pitied as depended on. Their end goal of failure. Gleaming sheets of straight black hair under which two twins labor aimlessly in the loamy, sucking dirt. Meanwhile, the blonde speaks with breath and enunciation of solitary to the overwrought tune. There's a train in the background, so apologies for that. In a bamboo cage. Clasping her arms around her knees, she signaled to herself and to others the perceived superfluousness of her presence. What she did was bounce in transport on the haphazard wagon. She drank them under the table. Was it her exceptional brown body which permitted her to do so? Of all the things I might have expected, was it the sexlessness of her fatigues, her androgyny? Against a dark brown background. She perceived the unscrupulous oriental and wide-eyed demonstration of the blue within punished for her swarthy attraction. He had that Neanderthal look to begin with, natively disturbing plants for food, whose indistinguishable mass of bitter leaves repulsed the pinched nose prisoner. A good ass up in smoke. So flame destroys the indecorous femme who had, in pigtails, allowed herself to be led behind a curtain, a drab sheet, and grovel maudlinly, who made a body spectacle and could demonstrate the terror of her own defilement by allowing herself merely to be positioned in the foreground where she was drank or swallowed up as easily as milk. The constancy of the nude panty. With her hair done up and curled, she disavows herself of tropical misfortune in the communal shower. Um, so those are my poems about Filipino exploitation films. Um, and now I'll be reading some more um, domestic poems that I think I wrote, I think primarily during uh, when New York was really locked down. Um, so, I imagined a den of warming light, a bit of slowness in a straight line, and imagined immersing myself halfway, slowly and insidiously into a body of water. There was no fairer weather. I was in opposed in my languor, returning again and again from an osmosis of sound. And nothing flowered, nothing cocked its head big as a dog's, no litmus test on the back porch. Pleasure was tempered by the constancy of pleasure. There was no failure to proceed. And when I assumed the posture of sleep, sleep came to me. I began to understand certain allures. For example, her low modulated voice situates me in a bathroom away from her husband. And I understand she is applying curlers to my hair, though I am partial to neurologist scenes. This is the most brilliant celebrity video and was shown vultures in your path in Texas, a semblance of dismissal in courtship. The wind chime sound indicated outsideness, and that moment of buoyancy on the live stream turned out to be my sister. My approach would be different this time, bound neither to languor nor to distress, and yet the arms placed elsewhere, I affixed to other eye a signifier, maintaining understanding, conceding comfortably, face bright with conciliatory good humor, acknowledging your riposte. Thought hardened, then spread, the beveled edge of a blade growing wider and slimmer. You open your mouth for me and the feeling grows stronger. My fingers are slight as I initiate. What shall I give you? Groin's fist tight, slow-mo makes widening. In the mind, a gesture takes hold, then body follows suit. Now that the skin of this fruit has slipped off, the inner flesh is revealed smooth as a stone in hand. I eliminate all trace of discipline in myself, 
content merely to lie open-legged in a candid and amorous state. As such, I set a new precedent against which no rebuttal can be made. Demarcate the page in shades of red to write with even tempered attenuation as thought occurs, to rest away language, to scale it in largest alienation. What this kind of labor promises, there's no need but pleasantry in the face of desultory emotion. My side hustles gimmicky and gives error to my writing life, but certain overtures make themselves known. Alarm is bifold wallet in a state of dispossession. Pen is upward stroke encounter alarming the effect what she said. Please equate me a gift of your filigree. I wanted to be taken seriously, I spent. Frugality wore well on you. I was with you in this economy. Your affectations delude no one and of you, my sister says, he is adorned. Boundedly, the food is set on wooden slats. Rigor in the spots of home and deceit and love is the empty word, I'm fulfilled. Objections nothing, just a ploy in mitigated air, and the obtuse sound of blowing consecrates the room in hand. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gia. Thank you for sharing your poetry with us today. That was beautiful and a great way to conclude this wonderful conversation with you, Jason and Paulina. Thank you, Paulina, for joining us late into your evening. And thank you, Jason, as always. Um, I'd like to also give a special thanks to Tom, Jake, and everyone, the extended staff at the Metro Picture, the extended staff at Metro Pictures for helping to make today's program possible. Um, we'd again like to thank the Metro Pictures for its extraordinary legacy that will continue on after the closure of its physical space. Uh, we encourage everyone to view our archive of these conversations on our YouTube channel, where we will upload today's conversation shortly. Join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for our 64th Radical Poetry Reading, curated by the legendary Robert Kelly, and featuring poetry read by Billy Chernikoff, Pierre Jory, Kimberly, Kimberly Lyon, and Jerome Rothenberg. Uh, you can now all turn on your microphones to say hello and goodbye. And thank you all again for joining us today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thank Paulina. You. Thank Thanks, you. Paulina. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you so Dad much. For showing up. Thank you, Gia. Your father's in the Happy house. today. <laughs> yes. Really hey, Charlie, Charlie. Good to see you. <laughs> Looking forward to the new issue. How many pages? 156. Oh, 156 wow. new record. pages. Bring it. Yeah. <laughs> Go rail. Looking forward to that. It's going to break mailboxes across the world. It probably has a spine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you, Gia. That was great. Loved thank you, Jason. Good no, thank you, Jason. Thank you. Yeah. you Thanks, Bonk. Everybody have a thank you. great thank couple. You. I'll see you in two weeks. Go see Paulina. Please go, Please go, go see, see Paulina. Paulina. Okay. Thank, thank you, Gia. Bye. Bye, guys.